In the FAQs on his now defunct website, Aaron Alston said that while he didn't have a clear favorite among the characters he'd written, he liked Laura Knotsill for her dramatic potential and Wes Jansen for all the humor he provided. It shouldn't really come as a surprise then that both of those characters feature significantly in Solo Command. And like with the previous book in the series, Iron Fist, I couldn't find any data that Solo Command made the New York Times paperback bestseller list for any of the weeks after its release. So I mistakenly thought going into Solo Command that the race were going to be masquerading as the Hawkbat pirates again, but I was wrong. While their ruse wasn't discovered, mostly because of Shala's quick thinking on Saphalor, they didn't step into the shoes of the Hawkbats at any point in this book. However, my memories of the rest of the book were pretty much accurate. So, a brief summary. Race Squadron's covert mission posing as pirates was a success, but Warlord Zinj is still on the loose. To defeat him, the race must join a combat task force led by General Han Solo, the only man crafty enough to beat Zinj at his own game. Up to this point in the X-Wing books, the main trio hasn't really played a prominent role in these books, which I very much appreciated. But in Solo Command, we get to see Han front and center being a general, which is something that we didn't really get to see in the Banta books up to this point, except for the Black Fleet Crisis trilogy. And I have to say, Han is pretty good at being in command. He has a good sense of strategy, he knows when to give up and when to keep pushing. And Alston also directly ties in how Han feels in Solo Command, that he's missing Leia, he's missing the Falcon, he's starting to feel really tired and depressed, which ties directly into how Han was in The Courtship of Princess Leia. One of the things that I think Alston does really well in this book is connecting it to the book that was written previously, but is set after, and there's lots of nice connections and callbacks to it that I think work really well. In the X-Wing books, I also like watching Wedge's progression as a leader. In Solo Command, he gives up direct control of Race Squadron to face Lauren, who's made Brevet captain, and he accepts command of all the starfighter units on Han Solo's flagship, Mon Ramonda, being the Rogues, the Race, an A-Wing unit, Pole Arm Squadron, and a B-Wing unit, Nova Squadron. And Wedge is just a really good boss. And I think that's most visible and most notable in how he treats Mindanos. Wedge is thoughtful and compassionate, and he really looks out for the people under him. He makes sure that Donos is being analyzed, being looked at, and when all the Twi'leks are removed from their positions temporarily because of Zinj's brainwashing scheme, he actively makes sure that they can return to duty as soon as possible. And Face really takes more of a leadership role in this book. He's now Wraith 1, he's pretty much in charge of Wraith Squadron, and he does mostly a good job at it. He's really progressed and grown a lot since Iron Fist, and really the only decision of his that I can find fault with is how he dealt with the Lara Knotsill situation. Face was reacting instinctively, intuitively to what he just read and what he just discovered. But unfortunately, that means that he talks to Lara, unbeknownst to him and to her initially, over an open communication channel. 
I really think it would have worked best if he waited until after the raid on Kidriff 5, until they had returned to the flagship and, you know, talked to her then. But if he had done that, if he had waited until after the battle, we wouldn't have had Min trying to take a pot shot at her, and we wouldn't have had Lara basically bolting, which drives a lot of the later plot. So while I didn't think it was the best decision, and Wedge does tell Face likewise, it was a plot necessity. We also get to see more of Wes Jansen, who really is Alston's go-to comic relief at this point. Jansen's just a friendly, happy, pleasant guy, except for one instance when they walk into the trap on Saffalor, Jansen just goes to just this cold, ruthless, efficient killer which is really shocking, emphasizes to you how dangerous of a situation they're in that Jansen's able to almost flip a switch and go from his normal self to this other scary Jansen. Jansen also helps prove a point, which is if you keep playing pranks on Wedge Antilles, he'll snap after a certain point and you might just end up wandering around naked with Ewok food smeared all over you. Sorry, Wes. And then the main focus on the race this time is on Lara Notsil and Min Donos. They are both two very damaged people who have to learn in different ways how to deal with and go beyond the trauma that they've had to live through. For Lara, she initially started out in the race, not on the side of the New Republic. This was going to be a temporary thing before she could return to Zinj. She changed her mind, she found real friends, and while she knows that she needs to talk to Wedge Antilles about her past, she keeps putting it off, leaving it for another day, another time. She also starts a relationship with Min Donos, who is the sole survivor of Talon Squadron, a squadron of X-Wings that was destroyed directly due to her influence. So until Face confronts her with what he's uncovered about her background, she's essentially living out of sight, out of mind, which isn't working so well for her. Donos tries to kill her, she flees, She's able to meet back up with Zinj, get a position on Iron Fist, and she actively plots to take down Zinj and his Super Star Destroyer, mostly using an army of mouse droids, which I loved. Lara can't return to her persona of Lara Notsil. It's completely blown, it's gone. But she doesn't want to be Gara Petithel again either. The more she thinks about it, the more she wants to be pretty much the only persona she's ever assumed that she was happy in, Kearney Slain. So Lara's dealing with a lot of issues, mostly psyche related, trying to accept what she's done, see how she can atone for it, make up for it, and then move forward. She's an integral reason for why the New Republic is able to triumph over Zinj at the Battle of Salagus, even if very few people will know what she ever did. She fakes her death, Wedge Antilles knows perfectly well what she's done, but lets her get away with it, remakes herself as Kearney Slain on Corellia, and sends a message to Mindanos that if he's interested, maybe they can have a second chance at happiness. Mindanos, on the other hand, already went through a lot in Race Squadron. He was catatonic at one point and was brought out of it by the other race. So you would think that he's gone through everything, that by being able to kill Admiral Triggett that he's moved on from what happened with Talon Squadron. But that's just not the case. That wouldn't have happened in real life, and that's not what happens here. He constantly thinks about whether it would be better for him to resign from Starfighter Command and just start this one-man vigilante hunt to find everyone who is involved in his squadron's destruction and make sure that they pay for it. 
But even harder is whether he can forgive himself for letting all his pilots die. He really holds everything in and is a tightly wound person. And finding out that Lara was actually Gara Petithel and was behind his squadron's death makes something in him snap again. He tries to kill her, he stops at the last minute, Wedge removes him from active duty and says, basically, you need to get analyzed, you need to get your head screwed on straight or we're gonna kick you out of here. So Donos has a lot of thinking to do and comes to some realizations that basically he can't keep everything locked up inside. He needs to let those emotions out and that's the only way he can forgive himself for what happened. When Ray Squadron is removed from Starfighter Command and moved over to Intelligence, he makes the choice to switch to Rogue Squadron. And while we don't get any resolution on Donos and Lara, Alston did say in his FAQs that he decided that they reconnected during the events of the Courtship of Princess Leia. And considering that we hear about a Dono slain expeditions in both the Legacy of the Force books as well as an X-Wing Mercy Kill, I'm pretty sure that they turned out just fine. Zinch continues to impress me how Alston took a character from the Courtship of Princess Leia who pretty much just seemed to have two traits, that he's angry and he's fat and turned him into a really interesting, really well-rounded character. Zinch throws temper tantrums, and for the most part, they are just a front, just a facade to make people misjudge him. But we do get one really good tantrum in here when he learns from General Melvar that the race captured Dr. Ed Agast. And this is like a legit tantrum. He is just smashing stuff because this is one instance where his carefully thought out plans fell apart on him. As Han's task force slowly attacks Zinj affiliated worlds and takes down his businesses, Zinj just seems to become lesser and lesser until he gets to the point at the final battle that he's literally backed into a corner. The emergency plan that he never wanted to enact, he has to enact. So we get a perfectly logical reason for why in the courtship of Princess Leia, Han Solo both said that he destroyed Iron Fist and then is con fronted with the Super Star Destroyer, Iron Fist. Zinj uses the remains of the Razor's Kiss, as well as his sometimes functioning, sometimes not night cloak satellites, and pulls off a very cool trick. He makes it look like Iron Fist has been destroyed, that he had to escape in a shuttle. But meanwhile, Iron Fist was just able to jump to hyperspace and the remains of the Iron Fist is actually the remains of the Super Star Destroyer that he lost in the previous book. And we also meet Dr. Etta Gast, who's one of the doctors who worked at the Bang Rain Laboratories. She is a dreadful person, willing to experiment on aliens and feel nothing about it. And the way that she's dealt with in the end felt so satisfying that she gives the New Republic information, they give her a new identity, and at her request, half a million Imperial credits. And then she's immediately arrested on Coruscant for sedition because no one is allowed with that many Imperial credits on the New Republic capital. So what I think Alston does so well is setting the stage for the courtship of Princess Leia, but in a way that can also bite you in the butt a little bit. The book ends with the story of Han Solo and Warlord Zinj continues in the courtship of Princess Leia. So while Alston brings it to a very satisfying conclusion, where you feel like Han has really accomplished a lot, the rogues in the race have really accomplished a lot, there's also that niggling feeling in the back of your head that, but it's not finished, he's still out there there's still another book to go. And unfortunately, I didn't find how the courtship of Princess Leia finished off Zinj to be really as satisfying as I would have wished. 
While I thought that the brainwashing plot line was effective and definitely seemed like a plan that Zinj would do, it was a little too close to Isard's ploy that she used with her brainwashed minions on Coruscant. And I also wasn't sure about the brainwashing timeline. The initial would-be assassin was incommunicado for a week, which I guess seems like enough time to brainwash someone. But Taldira was really only on leave for one day at a time, and one day just doesn't seem long enough. And while I thought that the subplot about Fel was properly foreshadowed, and I could accept the conclusion it made me feel sad for Wedge that he still has no resolution about the fate of his sister Sile and his brother-in-law. I also then started to wonder about Zinj's scheme, which all seems to rotate around the fact that no one sees Fel, but would really no one, even the people in his squadron, not see him? Were they in on the ploy too? Like, how, how deep did this go? I love the Millennium Falsehood. I love how they get a YT-1300 ship just like the Millennium Falcon. And Chewie and Han take one look at it and go, it doesn't look anything like the Falcon. I wish that we could have maybe seen some more of its missions though, because really the only ones we see are the raids on Kidrith 5 and then Comrin 5. And in the latter, I definitely had to reread those sections because I wasn't sure at first what was going on. It wasn't until I carefully read the section a second time that I realized they were actively trying to make the falsehood look like a YT-2400 to confuse Zinj's forces. So that clearly went over my head a little. And while I love the subplot with Donos and Lara, and I love the characterization that they get, their romance was awkwardly written at points. And like with the timeline for the brainwashing, I wasn't really sure about the timeline over their romance, because it seemed like they were only really seeing each other for such a short time before Face leaked her real identity. And I think I maybe would have bought it better if this had started in Iron Fist after Donos accompanied her to the real Lara Notsil's homeworld for that trap that Zinj set up. And so that this had been sort of like a low key romance going on for a much longer span of time. But on the whole, I absolutely loved Solo Command. I thought it was a great conclusion to the Ray Squadron arc. It had really funny moments, great, exciting space battles, which the first two books focused a lot more on their commando raids. So I appreciated getting to see them in loads of dogfights. I really enjoyed what Alston did with Han and with Zinj. And I'm 100% the kind of person that every time I finish Solo Command, I go on Archive of Our Own looking for stories about Donos and Kearney because I want to know that they're happy. So next time I will be reading Michael A. Stackpole's last X-Wing book, Isard's Revenge.